Hello, I'm Andrew Hara, the host of the Bomb Squad. I wanted to tell you about my movies. All are available on Tubi, which is a free streaming service. The last ones is a zombie drama about how a pandemic and isolation could drive a group of people mad. When the virus hits, John finds himself alone and scared until he meets Michael, his protector. But when Karina, another survivor, enters the mix, everything that John and Michael knew will be turned on its head. The last one is a zombie virus movie that's somehow even more relevant today. Plus, it has zombies. Check it out. Borderland is a mexploitation film about living in El Paso. When Sarah finds herself in debt to the cartel, she has until sunrise to find some missing money with the help of her executioner. Borderland is a true midnight movie and a lot of fun. Finally, the documentary Humble Spirits tells the story of the Han family including champion Jennifer Hahn from El Paso, Texas. The entire Hahn family has grown up in the combat sports and has helped shape who they are both in and out of the ring. Humble Spirits, a family of fighters, is the perfect documentary for boxing fans of all ages. Check out Tubi to watch all my films. Finally, The Empty Space, winner of multiple awards, including the Sacramento Horror Film Festival's Best of the Best, is a cosmic horror about Amy Andrews, who's dealing with anxiety and depression after a violent attack that killed her husband. As she tries to find herself, she starts to lose her grasp on reality. Or could it be something much more sinister? The empty space is full of twists and turns, with Grace DeWilder of Rue Moore Magazine calling it a powerful film full of excellent performances by practically every cast member. All of Andrew Hada's movies are available to rent or buy on streaming services such as Tubi, Amazon, and many other places. We hope that you help support us by watching these films. Now, let's start the Bomb Squad. Um, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Bomb Squad. We had a bunch of jokes, but then we got messed up, so we're, I'm not going to repeat them. That'd be weird. <laughs> yeah. No he confused directors named David yeah. with writers named they're, David. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, they're both writers. So anyway... Uh, thank you guys for joining us on the Bomb Squad. I'm director Andrew Hanna. This is my best friends, William Murdoch and Joshua Epp. And we are talking today about 2002's Panic Room, directed by David Fincher, one of the best living directors of all time, written by David Cope, one of the best writers who definitely didn't write Pitch Black. Yes, he did write Stir of Echoes, which we covered. Yes. I, we, we figured that out, and then I immediately forgot. Uh, this movie is accidentally a Pride Month movie, which we're always happy for, because it stars Jodie Foster, oh, it stars well, Kristen go. Stewart, mm-hmm. and then uh, I don't think Forrest Whitaker is LGBTQ, but I know that he's supportive. I don't know. We're done. It also starts Forrest Whitaker. It stars Dwight Yoakam, everyone's favorite Dwight. And it, of course, stars Josh's favorite actor of all time, Jared Leto. I don't even like him in the movies he's good in, which is this is one of them. But anyway, keep going. Jared Leto in um, Corn Rolls is always the best Jared Leto. Uh, Josh, since you love Jared Leto so much, will you tell us (laughs) what this movie is about? Yes. So, um, a single, a recently divorced mom and her, her precocious, um, 12 year oldish daughter, preteen daughter, um, uh, move into a extremely large house, way too big for them. Right. Um, but their first night, the, oh, and then, but there's a panic room in the house that, that comes into play in the title and the plot. It's pretty, it's um, major. It's major. <laughs> it's, it's very much the it's crux of the important. film <laughs> yeah. is that there is a panic room because the guy who lived there was a weird recluse billionaire, something like that. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, the very first night they're there, three robbers break in looking for money and cool. sh- things pop off pretty pretty rapidly after that. So, um, guys, will you do me a favor? Will you go pause this episode and then go listen to every other description of Josh's, whenever we <laughs> ask Josh to describe a movie that aren't Panic Room? Then go watch Panic Room and see if that this description was too long. <laughs> or, or see if there was another way that Josh might have been able to get across that same information. That could have been a while. I, I literally, 
I literally expected you to go, it's panic room. It is. It's about a panic you know, room. It's, it's about a panic room, but it's also really about their lives. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like a thriller with extra, you know? It's not just, mm -hmm. it's not just for the thrills. Yeah, I will say, like, so David Fincher has that famous quote where he says he makes films, and then he also makes movies, and his biggest example of a movie he made is Panic Room. Um, and he it's the one he always uses. He's like, I, I made Panic Room. That's not a film. That's a movie. And so, yeah. um, so that is his perception of it. And this is a William pick. So, William, why did you pick? Why did you take us into this Panic Room? Uh, I w I just been like thinking about it recently, and it is just like such kind of like an understated David Fincher movie. But it's also like it has so many of his like characteristics, like his camera work, uh, his kind of like interesting use of CGI, and it's just like really fun and yeah. talks about it and andrew's always asking me and josh to think of more picks and i thought it'd be perfect and it also turned out that neither josh or andrew had seen it before and it's like it's a fincher movie you know you gotta fucking see them all yeah and yeah, it's, 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 also thought it's this cool movie was pg-13 because i definitely saw it in theaters whenever it first came out and i must have been like <laughs> 14 but they definitely say yeah a bunch of times too so <laughs> I guess I snuck into Panic Room as a child. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's kind of one of those rated R movies where if you're an adult, you're like, why was that rated R? But then, like as a kid, yeah, you're like, this could be the F word a lot. With like three yeah. edits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I really was... will, and and like the head, the heads will explode as people are shot. Oh, that is like true. That. The, the violence so, is pretty good. Yeah. yeah, no, I like it. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, the violence. I, I will. Whatever happens, it's really good. Yeah, I think like. It is one of those things where, you know, no need to hate on Marvel, but we'll do it. Um, like, it's kind of like, this is what you expected back in the day. Like, Panic Room is like a very, like, anyone could have directed Panic Room. Like, Fred Ratner, it doesn't matter. But the fact that they got David Fincher to do it, he's like, adds this kind of gravitas. And he adds, like William was saying, he adds his own style. So, like, just because this movie is very simplistic... Yeah. It still has all of David Fincher's stuff. So it isn't like, you know, when you see a Marvel movie, you're kind of going to see the next Black Panther, but you kind of know, like, how it's going to look and how it's going to, how the action's going to be. But when you go see a Panic Room, like a movie like this, or even The Killer was this recent one, you're like, oh, I want to see how David Fincher is going to tackle this kind of plot, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just yeah, think, no, I, yeah, I, I think it was it's... pretty good. It's like it's like elevated in that sense because yeah. yeah it's see that's I almost appreciate it more because it's like you know he's he's really lending himself to just this like very simple movie you know it's yeah thank yeah, you David you know, Fincher like what he can do with like such a little bit of stuff well like it's not even like and... a slight movie but it's just like yeah his his style just brings like such a weird darkness to it that I think might not have been there for other people like if somebody else had directed it. Like, right, right. Yeah, it could have easily been like a. They could have like made the characters m way more generic, and it still would have played. You know, um, I also think my favorite thing is that is the best David Fincher uh, flourish that he does is wasting studio money because this movie starts <laughs> with like a bunch of shots of the city, and apparently it took them a year to make and like a billion dollars. And we don't ever spend any time outside of the house, like, after yeah. they get into the house. Like, they don't ever leave the house. But just so funny that how much... And I think even then, it still works in the movie, because it's kind of like... It's almost showing you how big New York is, so that when we get into the house, even though the house is bigger than normal, it's going to shrink things down. And once you get in the panic room, it's going to shrink it down even more. So I do think that while that uh, opening is hilariously expensive... It is also very on point, which another David Fincher thing. Like it works very well. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has like that major like claustrophobic feel, and um, yeah, like, just like the fact like whenever, I don't know Jodie Foster just does such a good job, like being just like this I don't know person in, like such a tough position because she's trying to be there for her daughter, but she's also in need of so much like self care as well. And there's like that scene where she's like in her empty bathroom, like taking that bath. And she just like starts crying like really intensely and then just like chugs her wine like right. hours before all these guys are about to break into her house. <laughs> Obviously she doesn't know that. 
yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's, yeah. it's like it's some it's like at one point it's like super claustrophobic but it's also super empty at the same time which is like you know that's an interesting kind of vibe to have which is probably how she was feeling you know at the same time just like yeah inundated with all these new feelings this is new life for herself but well, and I, also, I don't know you know, you know what i mean yeah i think like one of the things they really do at the beginning is that kind of like how quickly things can turn like because like you know you're in the bath you're, you're drinking wine you're, you're like done for the night you know you're like ready yeah. like there's nothing else i think a lot about it when i like do an edible and they get paranoid because it's like if someone was to break in right now i would be yeah. fucked like cringers he's gonna be asleep and i'm not i'm gonna be asleep too so it's like you know there's that fear and i think the opening again, like spending so much time outside of the house and really taking our time to get in there. I think that all adds so much of like understanding who the family is and what they're doing. In it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I know, it's very, yeah. It's kind of like you're saying like it's big, but it's empty. So it's almost this outsize. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's like, she, she seems so small in the house and then like, but then, like, the panic room is so small around them. I don't know. It's like this movie plays with, like, space really well. Yeah. David Fincher's, like, a good director, one, I guess. One, <laughs> one of my favorite things, though, is that they still do the trope where, like, Kristen Stewart is looking at, like, the most beautiful house of all of New York City. And she's like, I guess this will be cool. It's yeah. like, man, if I could have my own room <laughs> in the middle of New York City, I'd be like, hell yeah, mom, I love I you. <laughs> and then, like, whenever they finally see the panic room, she's like, "My room, that's." Me. I know. Just like, okay. yeah, it, and it's she's. Like, I mean, she's like the other she's options like, are like a house themselves. <laughs> yeah, she's got the super rich dad, so you know, like, she's just. A I know. Kid. Uh, yeah. You know what I love to. We'll also and talk this about is... this at the end. Kristen this Stewart. Oh no! Um, oh yeah. Like all the. Um, it, like like you know I could you see why David Fincher's like oh this is a movie because when the. Um, when the the, th- the three criminals break in to get to the house, you, like, know who they are within, like, two minutes of them speaking. You're like, okay, here's the kind of, like, regretful, sympathetic one. Yeah. Here's, like, the, the like the, the stupid loser asshole one. And then, like, the psychopath. Yeah. Like, right. it's like, it's like they, they split them up perfectly. And then you're like, oh, I didn't expect so much of this to just be them, like, bouncing off of each other, you know? So I was very, yeah. I was very yeah, pleasantly yeah. surprised by what, what characters these guys were, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like, they're, they're, they're so different. And like, like you're kind of saying it, it, it's sort of, it's like a little tropey in a way, but like all three of the actors are just like so good at their roles. Like Forrest Whitaker is yeah. just like, you see Forrest Whitaker and like, you just feel bad for anything that happens to him. Like he's just so sympathetic right. just like immediately. And like, everyone knows that Jared Leto is just such a fucking douchebag that it's like <laughs> perfect yeah. night cornrows to be like breaking into this house with this like master plan and it's like in Dwight Yoakam you don't really know him like I don't know, he's, he's good in his role too but I love the use of like Jared Leto in this movie for sure because like he's just yeah loud yeah I, I almost I almost try hard in real life that like him being like in this movie r- right perfect. it's it's like Fincher recognized how annoying he is before like everyone yeah. else did because he was just still yeah. like the hot cool guy in most things before this you know yeah. Even Fight Club, it's kind of like, oh, what a beautiful young man, you know. Um, right. but That's definitely what no. you should have gotten from his role in Fight Club. Yeah, <laughs> you know, his name was literally like Pretty Boy or something, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, and I even like in my notes, I even said like, because I think originally it was supposed to be Nicole Kidman. And mm, I just yeah. think it works so much better with Jodie Foster. Because Jodie Foster, I mean... Everyone who's watched anything with Jodie Foster knows this, but, like, she almost, like, she commands so much with her face where it's, like, she could almost do this as a silent film. And a lot of this film is silent, you know? Like, I mean, there's noise, but it's, like, she doesn't have dialogue. It's just trying to figure this out or this out. And so, but even before that, like, the bathtub scene that we were talking about, it's so well done that you just know exactly what she's doing just by how she's kind of moving her face, and it's very subtle. But yeah. it's like, and then you add in these three guys, and even Kristen Stewart. I mean, look at where she's gone. But it's like everyone yeah. is like acting their ass off in this movie, and so it's hard to not have fun with it, you know? 
Yeah, and I think that Jodie Foster and Kristen Stewart like just looks. There's like so many shots of their faces next to each other, and you're just like, yeah, you guys could so easily be mother. Oh daughter. yeah. Like what you were saying about like Jodie Foster over Nicole Kidman, like Jodie Foster for sure just has like that natural strength about her, mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah. Like I would believe that Nicole Kidman could fend off robbers, you know, if they were right. sure could figure it out, they could figure it out together. But like, whenever Jodie Foster's in this movie, like. Yeah, she's going to be fucking kicking ass the whole time. Like, she's going to be right. figuring out how to tape up a duct with propane coming through it. Or, like, you know, she's not going to be that worried about a gun. Like, she just seems like someone who would figure this out. And I think that really adds to her role in this movie of her, like, like the believability, you know? Yeah, she's definitely, like, she, she feels less vulnerable than Nicole Kidman, like, would, you know, almost. Because yeah. she, she almost seems more down to earth, whereas Nicole Kidman just has, like, the face of, like, a rich woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which also could have worked. I mean, I don't. I guess I don't want to record. Yeah, it would. Be, it would be very different, like vibes, like it just yeah. kind of a different. Well, like, and tone. I think, yeah, because like you see Jodie Foster, and you kind of see someone who seems like maybe not emotionally put together, but like physically put together. As weird as that sounds, even though like Nicole Kidman like clearly will tower over Jodie Foster, but I think that that makes Nicole Kidman almost more fragile, you know. And I think Definitely. it would have just been a very different story with Nicole Kidman. It, I don't think. I think it could have worked, but it wouldn't have been as kind of like, you would almost have to change some of the resourcefulness, you know? Yeah, yeah Jodie yeah, Foster's more scrappy. Of, like, the physicality around stuff too. What'd you say, Josh? She's more scrappy. She feels like, like yeah. Jodie Foster. It's like, okay, she could get into a scrape. Mm-hmm. Whereas Nicole yeah. Kidman, you're like, oh no, they're gonna like kick the shit out of her if they catch her. <laughs> she's so, right. she's it, so it frail been, and like, pale. Down the robbers or something to like make them less yeah. scary it would have just been like way more terrifying watching Nicole get them go through it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and even then, like, so the movie is, of course, they move into this house, they have the panic room, and they get into the panic room as these guys break in, and like, you know, they they have to keep them there. So, like, in a very smart move, the, the robbers tell them, like, hey, what we want is in that panic room. Mm-hmm. And so, like, my favorite part is really the beginning where they're both kind of like, well, what if we just why don't we just leave for a little bit? Let us leave, and then we you can get it, and then we can come back. Or like, there's so much of like, can we trust them we to like just get this? Yeah, and it's such a funny like, ah shit! If we had just like walked out into the backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just sort of like a weird jackpot. Like, it's like yeah, <laughs> but like they they know um, the one guy Raul, which is obviously not his name. Um, he's yeah. the Dwight Yoakam. He was yeah. just gonna kill everyone, you know. Like that was his plan. Was oh. just like, oh, I'm gonna totally. see. Gonna I don't. Kill everyone I don't know. This. At the beginning, I think he kind of gets more and more like agitated. Flushed. Well, but see, but then there's also the thing. So Dwight Yoakam is the only one who's wearing any kind of disguise. Yeah, and he's also like you. You realize, like now thinking about it, of course, he probably wore that disguise because he was gonna kill everyone. <laughs> I know. I and this way, that, exactly if anyone got true. out, yeah, he would have. He wouldn't have to worry about them seeing his face. Yeah. But yeah, it was. Yeah, a, so a, I, and, yeah. But it, it becomes that thing where it's like I love that these guys like barely know each other, and so they barely trust each other. And then you have Jodie Foster and Kristen Stewart, of course, have like kind of a rough thing with the dad and everything, and so you have just a bunch of people who don't really know how to behave around each other in both groups. And then you have them who don't know how to behave with each other in like overall. And I think that just makes, there's so much tension in the house. You know? they're, they're, sure. There's such a funny, yeah. Cause as soon as they, um, also I should say the opposite of Dwight Yoko is Force Whitaker literally wearing his work shirt with his name on it to this robbery. It's like, come on, man. Even oh, if you I thought know, the house was going to be empty, <laughs> don't do that. I know. <laughs> yes. Like, come on, just at least you could do the undershirt. But no. Um, like, take a day off for the like murder they, uh, and the robbery. <laughs> as soon as they get in and realize, like, what happened, that the, um, you know, it's like, oh, people are in here. They try to get them. They get to the panic room. Um, Jared Leto is like, oh, fuck this, and starts trying to smoke crack as to, to calm down. Yeah, and yeah. and Mercer is like, man, not right now. And it's just like, oh, what a per, what a per, like, it just tells you everything about it. Like, what a, what a dumbass, like, right yeah. over Yeah, it's like crack, the thinking man's drug. <laughs> this might be one of the best Jared Leto roles, I will say. One of the few movies to use him right. 
So yeah, he does a he does a great job. He's so like frantic and like he just makes you like nervous, like he's gonna ruin everything somehow. And then like, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead too far, but, but yeah. Yeah, well, see, and, and I think that that's even better. Like, or Jared Little's kind of set up as he should be the leader, you know? Like he's handsome. He seems like he's the one who knows everything, but he's literally like the least capable out of the three of them, you know? Even out of kind of Jodie Foster and the kid. You know? like, he just right. can't do shit. Yeah, he definitely leans on like the, this is my idea, this is my plan, mm. like this is why I should get paid for sure. Yeah. Because yeah, he comes to them, like he, he, you don't really know why he's, he knows that there's not supposed to be anybody in this like apartment, but he's like, yeah, there's, uh, it's two weeks in escrow. And like, yeah, he's like, but it's business weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like five so days she... per week, right? And he's like, just like, you're fucking dope, dude. You didn't to be know, fair, I don't know either. Well, if, like I, I didn't know how escrow works, so I, I do agree with him there. It's a very confusing thing, but but if you were going to rent a house, you might look into it. You might, <laughs> yeah, like do a little Google. Little library. <laughs> but you also have to remember that this is a gang who's not taking off their work shirts for the robbery too. So <laughs> and also, like... can we just say like his his plan? Because to to kind of get ahead of it, he tells them, "Oh, this safe has three million in it." But it turns out it's like close to like twenty million, and he like knows that, and you find out he knew that. And um, first worker's like, "So what did you think was going to happen when we open the safe? Right. And see like twenty million dollars in there?" And it, and he doesn't answer at that point. But it's like, yeah, literally, <laughs> like what a bad plan to screw over but these see, two guys. Right. By yeah. that point in the film, I could see him coming up with that plan, like and not even re- realizing, oh hey. How am I gonna get you know seventeen million dollars <laughs> out of here? And it's also like, okay, there's three of you. Mm-hmm. That would be like five million dollars each more. And he still was like, I don't know. Let me go for the full seventeen and a no, half no, or whatever. Not thing. only that, you find out um, the the reason he knows about this is because he yeah. was the caretaker for the old man who lived there. Mm-hmm. Um, so he just knew like where he hit the money, but at the end when he's pretty much ready to give up, he's like, you know what? I'm still like, if I report this money and it goes through the will, I'll still get like 15%. So he still is going to get like a million dollars, <laughs> literally enough to live off of. Right. Just, yeah. I mean, he's just so him. greedy and like stupid. Hours, but... Yeah. He would have spent that all on crack. He, yeah, um, it, it wouldn't have worked out, obviously, but... Yeah. Well, and then it's kind of... I know. It's kind of funny, because the first thing they really try is by putting, like, propane gas in the vents, which it's like, that scene, it's like, that's the first thing you guys tried, because that's, like, that should be plan Z. <laughs> like, that's... You're going to... And even then, like, Forrest Whitaker the whole time is like, they're gonna die. Like, they can't open it if they're dead inside. And the other two are like... Open it more. Open it more. <laughs> <laughs> they're like they're not gonna die. <laughs> yeah, like, they're so bad at everything. Just, <laughs> just like incapacitate them. Because um, then they were like, "Oh, well, they'll pass out, and then they'll throw up." And it's like, again, you need them inside to open up the inside. That was that was one scene where because I do think um because this movie does a lot um, kind of very similar to Fight Club where it will do a lot of, like, zooming out or into CGI from, like, something real, so it's you, you're supposed to be part of it. And, you know, it's, like, you can tell if you're really looking at it, but otherwise it really works. Um, but right here, obviously, she lights the, the fire is the on worst fire. one. The yeah. fire looks really bad. And, and maybe yeah. propane fire would burn blue like that. Uh, maybe it that's, would. like, the scientific thing. But it looked, it would look, I don't know, it just looks so wrong. It's like you're already CGI and it's like super blue on top See, of it. It just looks so bad. And I think that that's the thing. I, like, it would look blue, but because we're not used to blue flames, like you mix that with early 2000 CGI, and I feel like our brain just cannot process that image. And then Fincher really goes all in on that fire because it's, it's like... Right. You see, yeah. it's so far, and then it's, it's on like Jared Hellboy. Little's arm. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, at one point, Jared Little looks like Liz Sherman from Hellboy. Yeah, he's just like, oh, did, you see, yeah. did you see the CGI, though? I don't know. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> there's so much because everything else, like, there's that one scene where they like kind of uh, they're like banging on the wall and it zooms into like the paint and you see the paint starting to kind of chip because it's being hit so hard, you know. And that's really cool. That's good. But yeah. but the fire, yeah, the fire. Is yeah, cool. and and I'm gonna say like I don't really care about bad CGI. Most movies no. now have bad CGI. It's more that everything else in this movie looks so good. This is the only part that takes you out of it because you're like, oh, yeah, weird that this one one thing didn't work and everything else does. You know. Yeah. You know what really took me out of it was that it doesn't change the lighting that much, and it almost should change it a hundred percent because you're lighting a huge light in the room. Oh, the blue, but yeah, the blue flame. Yeah, it stays oh, the dark, and so yeah. yeah, that would just it. It just makes it a little hard. But Should've I just still found think orange flame would have would have looked yeah. no better. It would have been less realistic, but yeah, you're just you're doing CGI. Who cares? Yeah. Um. Oh yeah, so like apparently one of the reasons that Fincher picked this movie is because Fight Club had so many locations. <laughs> Fincher was like, <laughs> oh, "That's enough." Yeah. yeah. Because if you think about it, yeah, there's 150 locations in Fight Club. Because he has to chase uh, uh, himself, and then he has to like go to the hotels. And, the yeah, there's the yeah, yeah, and he's like searching. There's airplanes. There's fight clubs. Airports, there's, like, offices. Yeah, it's pretty much every. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, every environment. Um, you know, it's funny though. Um, you know, like a lot of directors, you can tell when a movie was made before or after 9/11. Yeah. Um, is uh, you know Michael Bay probably the best example? But this movie, if you watched it in Fight Club back to back, you'd be like, "Yeah, nine eleven never happened. This is just yeah. a normal continuation of this like exact same style." And that's it's in what, New York. That's what you should have gotten from Fight Club. That if it <laughs> had succeeded, nine eleven would not have happened. Well, if you think about it, just someone would have already, Fight Club analysis. <laughs> someone would have already blown up yeah, buildings in Fight sure. Club, so they're not going to do nine eleven when Americans do nine right. eleven to ourselves. That was, I think, yeah. Ben Laden's biggest thing is he wanted to be original. <laughs> he didn't want to. Yeah. He's not going to be copying anyone. Um, oh well, <laughs> William. Uh, like I fucking failed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be funny if he saw it. He's like, wait, it's still up. Um, <laughs> So apparently it did get altered when Nicole Kidman left. And before she left, it was going to be more as like a Hitchcock, Grace Kelly kind of role. But with Fuster in the lead, they kind of changed it to be more gritty. Which like, I kind of wish that we could ask David Cope, like, so did Fincher come in and say like, hey, you got to change everything about this script or what happened there? Yeah, yeah. Like what kind of changes were like, were they major changes? Was it like tone? Like... I, I, yeah, there's really. there's so like few she she doesn't have a lot of lines when she gets to the panic room so mm-hmm. honestly it really is just probably just filming her a different way you know? well yeah. Uh, yeah cause I wonder like there's a scene uh, later where they're like trying to find or they're trying to get the phone and so Jodie Foster oh that's such a good scene back. yeah and and I wonder like to me that scene works perfect with Jodie Foster cause it's very tense She's running like you have to see if she's going to come back in time, if they're going to catch her, the if, if yeah. the door is going to close, you know? And, like, to me, that was always the scariest thing. Like, was the door going to close? Because they say at the beginning, like, yeah. it kind of works like an elevator where if you put something there, it stops mm-hmm. it. And so I was like, oh, man, <laughs> like, the door's not going to close because that would be my first thing. But, so, like, how would Nicole Kidman do that? Like, did because she, she's so tall and, like, kind of athletic, you know, <laughs> Yeah, they would have had to have like a taller door or something. Or yeah. Like... <laughs> well, and the funny, the funny thing is, is, I don't know if you noticed this, but apparently since they had already built the things for Nicole Kidman, that's why the laser is very short on Jodie Foster because it's at normal height for Nicole Kidman, oh. but they couldn't change it. But I also think that that ends up working because when I saw that scene, I was like, oh, because she's not supposed to really be in this house. So, you know, like this house wasn't made for yeah. her, so it definitely yeah, added to the idea. But yeah, apparently that was yeah, not the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just accidentally. Yeah, accidentally worked out. But and I think like the cool thing about this movie because a lot of times when you see these kind of, I mean, we covered one with Hellraiser, but these one location films. Mm-hmm. One of the weird things is like, how are they going to like keep you entertained and also keep you so that you're not watching? you know, the same shots every 10 minutes. Totally, and I, yeah. 
I think the way this works really well is it's almost set up as like it's very almost episodic with like they'll they will come up with a plan then okay what's going to go wrong what's going to go right like are we going to make any progress or are we going to be further behind yeah and so i just think that that's very smart the way they did it you know totally and also like how we were talking about like the interactions between like the different people in the different areas like it's almost kind of like a play in a way too yeah like how the I mean, every movie, things change between characters, but, like, having the two separate stories happening simultaneously, like, between the robbers and then between Jodie Foster and Kristen Stewart, and then also between the two groups, like, there's kind of, like, enough story to kind of keep you entertained as well without having to change locations. Like, kind of, like, three separate narratives in a way, which is pretty smart. Yeah. Well, and I think it's that thing where, like, every character is actually pretty dense, considering, like, what this movie is about. And so I think you can't, you would have to do that to make it interesting. Because, like, yeah. again, I mean, we talk about how anyone could make this, but also anyone could make this very boring. This movie could have gone right. the yeah, other way very definitely. quickly. Yeah, and so I think it is that thing where it's, like, because he adds so much at the beginning, we understand these characters. So when they start, like, acting different, or, like, kind of, like, reacting to what's going on, you're like, okay, I understand what why they would do this, and it makes it more interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's really solid. Yeah, I also think, like, um, so, like, at one point, one of my, another of my favorite scenes is that, like, near the end, she, they have, so the husband comes and they beat the shit out of him, which was, like, a bad idea for the husband. And so now they have him hostage, <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, we have your husband hostage, which she's like, don't give him. And then, like, at one point, the police come, and so she has to open the door. And she's just doing a terrible job, but that was... A, like a very smart way to do like a reversal of the clear scene because a lot of times it, it's almost a criminal's answering the door like in suicide kings for example um yeah and in this one they're actually it's the opposite they're she's she needs the police but she has to pretend that she doesn't right right and so it's, it's just so a very it's so yeah because then the cops like ma'am there's anything going on that maybe you can't talk to us about yeah why don't you do some blinking and it's like well if she can't talk about it they can clearly hear you dude she's she gonna blink <laughs> they're gonna see it right away like you can't see also, it um no. i was just thinking i was just like the way that she's looking at him though, like her eyes like she's just mm-hmm. almost moving them so much and i was like trying not to blink too because like, <laughs> yeah and you're you're like waiting for her to give him a signal like you're like how is she yeah. gonna do it you know Right, because yeah, she starts like talking about nonsense afterwards. Mm-hmm. She's like, Here it comes. Oh, that was really. That's cool. also like, I mean, to to me, like, what what's cool too is, at no point, because I don't know, I feel like it, it's kind of going back to the Nicole Kidman thing. You're like, oh, you almost want the cops to help her because it's like, oh man, she's so like probably terrified right now. But with Jodie Foster, she really kind of conveys like, oh, I don't care, like I don't care if I die, but this like if you guys come in, my daughter's dead, you know? So it's more like, this is literally only like to save her. And you almost like kind of just see that on her face. I don't know, man, what a good actress. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I might, I might try to shoot a former president to get her attention later. Ooh, that doesn't work. I've heard, (laughs) Um, but it it will kickstart your music career. Um, There we go. Oh, so the fire on Jared Little was real. They just CGI'd it to be blue. <laughs> That's a much worse. Not, not a great choice in that one, Fincher. Yeah. You know, you know who plays the cop? The the one of NYPD's finest. It was um, the priest from The Sopranos, Father Rintintola, who like hits on Carmela. Oh, oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. What's he doing in your house? In the Sopranos. I know. Yeah. I oh, was and like, also, oh. the guy, the, the the neighbor across the street who they're trying to signal with the flash. Oh, Andrew Kevin Walker. Yeah, the writer of Seven. Yeah. He writer always, of Seven yeah. and the killer. He always like has that. to throw that he guy a bone. Him. Yeah. <laughs> He's always helping Andrew Kevin Walker out when he doesn't need it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, like, overall, and so, like, you know, I don't know if we want to spoil the end because it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, think- I mean, this movie is free on to, or on YouTube, actually, so you can watch yeah. it at any time. I will say, 
don't do it on your TV. Do it on off your PC with an ad blocker because those ads are outrageous. Oh, really? Yeah. Every ten minutes on YouTube. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's bad. Yeah. Um, it's but anyway. Three three fifty on Amazon if you want. Yeah. Had I known how bad the ads would be, I would have just paid the three bucks. I think it's definitely yeah. worth it. What a hidden gem. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, like, Fincher makes so many good movies that you kind of, like, not forget, but it's, like, when he makes a movie like this, so it's, it's kind of like The Killer reminds me of it, too, where it's, like, almost bare bones. You're like, oh, yeah, he can kind of do anything. And I think, like, yeah, right. there's also, like, there was that window where I felt like Fincher was almost challenging himself, where he was doing, like, Gone Girl and uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Like, he was picking these kind of summary books. Just yeah, to be like, thrillers. yeah, like, let me elevate this a little bit. Cause like, yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's such a weird way that the way Fincher works where he, everything always looks very different, but if you can always tell it's Fincher, he leaves a lot of the same things, but, and like, I mean, God Girl is, I mean, it's, it's more than a summer read. It's a classic film. So same thing with yeah. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, all bangers. Yeah, no, yeah. We, we all recommend it, but yeah, now you can do spoilers. Let's, let's get into this get into the oh ending. well the only thing i wanted to say for the ending was i thought it was very funny because they get out obviously and then at the very end they're like sitting on a bench and they're like looking at house listings and they're like what if we live here what if we live here and i was like your house literally just saved your life like in every situation <laughs> you could possibly imagine yeah, i would never would, leave that house again it would be I mean, You'd associate it permanently with the trauma of the night. I would fucking hang Jerry Little from the rafters and be they like, also, I killed like, that guy. That wasn't, I mean, and you find really out, idea. you find <laughs> out after that, uh, it's because the dad, what lives right across the park, and he's rich, so it just oh. doesn't matter what the cost is, but it, that house literally has like five bedrooms and like six fireplaces. It's like yeah. that, a, one, two people living in that house is too few. This, this is... You're not gonna like it. It's too much. Yeah, the, the problem would definitely would have been the house would have been too big. <laughs> been that's too that's nice. what people complain about now in the housing market. <laughs> Jody Foster does say, "Do you need a space?" Yeah. Going through the listings, and Kristen Stewart's like, "Next page." We also didn't mention that Kristen Stewart is a skateboarding routine, so she would fuck up all the floors with her oh, skateboard. And I, I do also want to. <laughs> yeah, they do have that scene. Where uh, after the propane tank, and then Jodie Foster's like, "Don't ever do anything like that." And I was like, "Oh, he even kept this scene or this line of dialogue." <laughs> <laughs> That's a placeholder line of dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tell me. Um, obviously, you, you'd already known what had happened, but because um, I said, "Yeah," like basically, Derek Jolito gets capped when he tries to leave. Mm -hmm. Dwight Yoakam. Yeah. Tries to take control, loses the gun. They're trying to get out. Dwight Oakum dies. Forrest Whitaker actually ki helps. He kills him because he's going to... Right, because Dwight Oakum is going to kill everyone. Yeah, and Forrest Whitaker is like, oh, I'm, I'm such a reluctant thief with a heart of gold. I don't want to do this. Yeah. So he's he's running away like with the bearer. It turns out to be bearer bonds. I think they did that because him literally having to hold a giant bag of $20 million would have been too cumbersome. It wouldn't have been a um, cool scene, yeah. Yeah, because the cops are like, get down, and he's holding them, and he has to let them go, both literally yeah. and figuratively. Um, yeah. And they kind of have him, and it's zooming in on him, and it's zooming in on Jenny Foster, like, processing, like, the horror of the night. And I was like, it almost implies that they're going to help him, because the daughter's super sympathetic to him. But you just don't really see him again. It's just, it's kind of, it's right. like a weird, like, yeah, you, but... you, you never really know what happens <sighs> with that, but they kind of imply it, right? Well, I thought so, too. And then they show the dad just, like, laying there, like, barely alive. And I was like, he did fucking bring hell upon their night. <laughs> See, that's... And I think that's kind of... That's one of the things I like, and I almost feel like maybe it is a studio... Like, I could 100% see in the script them helping him, but I kind of feel like that's a uh, Fincher touch, because I can... Also, Fincher's not, like, really one who lets people get away with, like, their things without some kind of punishment. So that's why I really love that scene. Because the whole movie, they're kind of setting Forrest Whitaker up to be, like, he's sympathetic. He's doing this because he has to. Like, he has to, like, help his family and stuff. And so at the end, it's like, yeah, but, like, you still don't get to rob people for no reason. And that's why it's like he still doesn't get out. 
Like, there's uh, no redemption. I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the narrator in Fight Club kind of gets away with it. Name one bad thing yeah. that happens to him. In the, at, that's what you should have gotten from Fight Club, <laughs> is that he's, he's doing really good at the end of Fight Club. Yeah, he's an act killer. He's, just, got a, he's got a hot girlfriend. He's in charge of a cult. He just committed a huge terrorist act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great place to be. It's a good it's a good uh it's a good uh startup is what he has. It's a paper, um, you know. But yeah, I think like and I think that's kind of again what makes it interesting is like that's the thing is that even in this film you still see Fincher's point of view, you know, like with Zodiac, which we'll cover eventually. He very clearly has someone who he thinks is the Zodiac, and he does not shy away from letting you know who he thinks it is. Right, yeah. Um, and it's that thing where it's like, there's that no point where he's like, oh, let's make sure this hits all four quadrants, you know? Like, he's, he's like, no, we're telling a story, and, like, the story has to be told. And I think that that's very interesting and very good. It's almost like, I don't know, to me, and obviously it's like a whole other conversation, but... To me, one of the reasons Zodiac doesn't totally work, whereas something like Panic Room works perfectly, is Fincher's so good at storytelling that trying to fit, like, the weird, almost non-story of Zodiac into a story structure is, like, I don't know, it it, it feels weird to me. I'm like, oh, this doesn't really work narratively as, like, a story story. I don't know, but you're so good at doing that that right. you're, like, taking it. That's so. That's definitely what I got from... From Zodiac, because there wasn't enough story <laughs> yeah. in Zodiac. It's almost like it's like kind of sprawling and doesn't go anywhere, which is how life works. Like that's how it happened. But he's so good at like. Did you like watch the preview or something? <laughs> it's just, you can't like I don't know. You can't end that way. And be like, oh, this guy's the fucking Zodiac <laughs> on a true story where we don't know. <laughs> Okay. We'll cover it when we cover it. I feel like it's going to be quite... I almost want to... It doesn't matter. We'll talk about it later. Um, but yeah, Zodiac. The famously bare-bones film. Um, but I think... And I I do think, like... I think some people sometimes criticize... Or, like, they use his movies versus films thing as a way to kind of dismiss these movies. But if you are one of those people, I would say don't do that. Because even though this is, like, it's not a 7 even, where 7 is pretty, like, heavy, um, it's still very well done. It's still, like, super interesting, and I just think it's it's a good one. Yeah. A++. Plus plus. Just a a good plus. Josh is going to be like, you know how Gone Girl is about that girl who never did anything wrong? <laughs> Uh, I think the actually good, she did do wife. some. <laughs> she did do some things wrong. She was, she was just, you know, she was just trying to get the spice back in her marriage, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> the Dune spice. Um, but yeah, guys, welcome back to the Bomb Scout. We'll have some more live episodes coming up. We'll also have some more fun episodes. There should be a. Um, oh, we're gonna have a theme episode eventually. You'll love those. Um, and then we'll have, we'll go straight into Halloween, but so it's going to be a fun season or whatever we call these. The Thank you guys for joining us back. Podcasts. Yeah. We, welcome back from summer break. Cause we <laughs> took a, we had a fun time in Portland. Will there be a montage of all our things? No, I don't know how to do that on this program. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all the season. We can post them all. Yeah. But thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next week on The Bomb Squad. Share with your friends. Share with anyone. Just have it on in the background. Just make sure that we don't get another 10 views on a... <laughs> yeah, play it at work. We don't, you don't need to see us. Come on. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you guys next time on The Squad de Booms. Stop. You know...